Susanne Beirut, MD, Professor of Psychiatry at Örebro University, University of Örebro. And uh, you are mostly working with adults, aren't you? Yes, I'm an adult psychiatrist. Yeah. And uh, you are going to talk about hands in our adults and if there are any boundaries or not, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Stay with yours. I think I'm pretty close. Did you, did you get on the floor? Yes, I think so. Um, I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for Gunilla um, Gala. Uh, her son turned in in Pandas in 2012. And um, uh, he has recovered, I must uh, say that. But uh, I had worked uh, 10 years with the city and I was quite sure that I knew uh, everything and I had moved on to work with autism. And in fact, uh, then I realized, well, maybe I haven't done everything. And when I look back to my uh, patients I've had with OCD over the years, it was only uh, two, three of them that I would recognize as having uh, pandas. And I, I came up with a textbook on OCD in 2002 and I, I I described a couple of cases, but I, I, I believe it was very rare. Um, well, I was perhaps wrong. Um, sometimes uh, boundaries are rather like barriers, and um, uh, perhaps we make up these um, barriers ourselves. And, and one of those is that uh, related to age, and, and Christopher was kind of mentioning this, that we are, we are, there are child psychiatrists, they're working with children, and then there are adult psychiatrists working with adults. And I remember once when I was uh, lecturing for a uh, child psychiatrist as a group, I've only been working two years with child psychiatry and an adult psychiatrist. So I, I told my, uh, my colleagues that I apologize that uh, we in adult psychiatry, we behave like uh, our patients are born like uh, when they are 18. And, and then one of the child psychiatrists raised her hand and said, oh, you don't have to apologize for us, they die at 18. <laughs> and, and this was no kind of no connection between them. Uh, another uh, part is that uh, clinicians are very um, should I say conventional or conservative, skeptic towards new diagnosis. And often they say they are non-existent or very rare. And when I started to work with OCD in the 80s actually, my colleague said, well, this is such a rare disorder, you probably won't meet so many patients with OCD. And all we had to do was put a note in the paper and we had all these patients who wanted to participate in studies and they had OCD, of course. 15 years would be time duration of illness when they came to us. Uh, and then I went over to work with um, ADHD in adults and I said, no, ADHD grows away when they're adults say it's gone. Well, that's not quite true. And then I was very interested in autism in people with normal intelligence and they said, no, no, autism is only in people with intellectually disabled. So we have been wrong before. And I think this is a very, very fascinating uh, quote by Thomas Insel, who is one of the most renowned psychiatrists in our, in our time. And he said that uh, these are the disruptive insights that transform our uh, view on, on psychiatric disorders. They are brain disorders, they are developmental disorders and complex disorders. They are not only personality conflicts or, or serotonin uh, deficits or whatever. But this is 10 years ago, and he doesn't mention inflammation. He doesn't mention immunology. So this is how fast it has gone. And to, because to most of us here, we would say that oh, immunology is also a, a very important for our understanding, not only of PANS, but for, for bipolar disorder, for, for schizophrenia, for uh, OCD and, and autism, ADHD. Um, and I think we have to, so this is a fast pace, but it's good also to look back, kind of, uh, um, and I think the example of mums is very, very interesting. Mums is post-hook in Swedish. 
and it's uh, the, the the expression of mumps is very different depending. It could you know it could affect different uh, organs. It could give meningitis in, in quite a number and pancreatitis and encephalitis in fact. And some of them don't even have a parotitis. And so uh, the doctors at that time to understand that to delineate this and to understand that this was one virus that have caused all this. It's, um, I think it's kind of uh, fascinating to think and what, how it applies to us today. And also the fact that the outcome differ very much if you, if you uh, retract uh, mumps when you were a child, there's another outcome than if you um, retract it as, as an adult much more severe uh, outcome. So I think this has uh, some um, uh, carryover to, to puns, and I, I, I agree a lot with Christophe how he looks at this. I think perhaps puns in infancy could cause uh, regressive autism or intellectual disability. At least we see some children that goes in and out in an autism uh, while having flares. Um, and I think that uh, puns in childhood uh, not only could cause a chronic OCD, but also uh, schizophrenia in other food. And um, one could ask myself, are there any similarities between schizophrenia and puns? And uh, there are quite a number, and one of them, which I think is very interesting, is visual hallucination. And visual hallucination uh, is very common in childhood onset schizophrenia, and it's also associated with poorer IQ and poorer functioning. But a quarter of that is, uh, schizophrenia has also visual uh, hallucination. Otherwise, it's, uh, uh, it's uh, hearing hallucination, auditory, which is most common schizophrenia. But about a quarter of the kids with with uh, with puns also have uh, visual hallucinations, and uh, it's also associated with the severity of illness and suicidal thoughts. So this is one similarity among many others. Another similarity is this uh, deterioration of, of drawing skills, and this is a I think it was a seven-year-old boy with a typical, very classical pants with. A, obsessive compulsive symptoms and this is how he drew after he fell in with parts. Um, but this deterioration in artistic skills we also see in schizophrenia. Um, Ash Josephson is one of our most um, uh, already in his lifetime renowned uh, artist. He was uh, very very talented and uh, he caught um, syphilis in a young age. So I had the syphilis, and it probably was because of his syphilis, he later uh, developed a psychosis and schizophrenia, and he thought he was God, and he thought he was Jesus himself, and he was very ill. And this is how he painted uh, after becoming ill. And it, you can see that he lost uh, most of his technical skills. I have another artist, and he came from Lund, confidently uh, kept very close here to Malmö. And he was, uh, had his mental problems already in art school, but he was also a very, very good landscape uh, painter. But already at 28, he, he fell in, in schizophrenia. And uh, he made thousands of uh, artwork after he became ill, and although people might think they are more interesting, the technical skills can't be compared. Um, psychiatric comorbidity, uh, although I speak of the diagnosis like entities, I'm, I'm not really fond of it. I, I think of uh, psychiatric disorders as a number of symptoms, which could, each symptom could be a, a card, a deck of cards. And the patient, uh, the same cards are used in different diagnoses. And if you're going to, if you're going to uh, also have the, the biological markers, you probably need a couple of decks more 
So uh, I would look at it like that. So symptoms, etiologies, and biomarkers, they overlap a lot between different psychiatric disorders. Um, I'll call it comorbidity, uh, that's the term we have. But ADHD uh, is um, um, an umbrella term for ADD. Uh, and in the attention deficit, they have procedure memory problems, they have uh, clumsiness, language delay, uh, sensory problems. And here we also have the autism group, and some have intellectual disability and others don't. And you have the Tourette disorder group, and you have obsessive compulsive disorder, and you have um, hoarding, which is its own diagnosis nowadays. And you have, I make it easy for you, depression and, uh, or anxiety disorder in one group, and then the eating disorder, and then there's addiction, and catatonia, and psychosis, and personality disorder, and separation anxiety, and all sleep poorly. And here, perhaps, in the middle, we have puns. Or perhaps I could just transform these puns to uh, being the treatment resistant group. Um, I have become very interested in treatment resistance. In your end of your career, you try to do something worthwhile. So what can we do about the treatment resistant cases in psychiatry? And they are very common. Among schizophrenia, it's about 30%, and among OCD, also 70% of the patient that won't recover uh, very well with the treatment we have in psychiatry. And it's associated with early onset and catatonia specifically, if for psychosis, and uh, when it's in schizophrenia, it's also associated with onset of OCD. Reversely, uh, in OCD, it's associated with schizotypal personality traits and autistic traits. So there's a, there's a, a combined group, and I would say that this is the schizo-obsessive uh, disorder group, which is not an established diagnosis in our, in our um, in our manual, but it's nevertheless there. And what's characterized this schizo-obsessive disorder group is that they, they are they're more severe, um, they have severe OCD during the programmer stages of the disorder, that it's an earlier onset of psychosis, there's more depression, more suicidal attempts, and more motor problems, and they are more socially hostile, socially impaired, anxious, uh, poor uh, quality of life, dysfunction, and treatment resistance. About 15% of the schizophrenia group uh, belong to this uh, schizo-obsessive group. And if you look at this, uh, I would say that they resemble PANS in, in to a large extent. So in summary, I would say that PANS patients very often exhibit a schizo-obsessive a clinical feature in adulthood, and they tend also to be treatment resistant. Now, I want to go over and just uh, present something else, which is also have, um, have something to do with uh, PANS, and that is uh, uh, the psychosomatic medicine, uh, which I think is important to include when we discuss uh, parts. And this is a, a woman who fell ill with headaches and anorexia nervosa at age 15. She, um, she's a South American origin, she's grown, grown, grown up in Sweden, she's, she was doing fine in school, she had friends, she was not bullied, had a good relationship with her family, she had lots of friends, no problem. She was quite good at school. At age 18, she fell ill with a, a strep infection. Um, she uh, had severe tics. Uh, she had nightmares, night terrors, rage attacks, difficulty walking. She was uh, very thin, and she came. They put her as an inpatient at the neurological clinic, and they did all the, uh, the assessment, and everything turned out normal. She didn't have any signs of infection and they, they sent her home. Uh, but she didn't reco recover, so after several months, uh, one of the uh, pediatricians read in the notes that this might have been, uh, this might be uh, a pun 
unless after all, there were elevated strep titers and then they prescribed uh, two weeks of penicillin to her. And she uh, recovered instantly. But as you all know, that is that uh, two weeks of penicillin uh, won't uh, do the job. So gradually uh, she became worse again. And she, uh, she was, during several times she was actually assessed by a neurologist. And at age uh, 22, uh, her, all her symptoms had uh, came back, even worse. And she had a, a clearly an OCD, she had a lot of panic attacks, she had gained quite a bit of weight. She, uh, she walked so poorly that she had to use crutches at times. Uh, and she had this uh, relapsing, uh, terribly um, um, attacks of pain and regressive behaviors, and she didn't respond to treatment. And when you met this uh, young woman, she was kind of smiling and says, well, I'm not so good, but um, oh, life is okay anyway, you like that. And this is what they call la belle indifference in, in uh, that a person who is very, you know, lots of symptoms, nevertheless have a sign that it doesn't trouble them. And it's, and it's thought to be a, a, a sign of conversion disorder. I would say, I think it's a sign of inflammation in the brain, actually, because you can also see it in, in, for instance, Alzheimer's disorder. And for you who are not psychiatrists, what is conversion disorder? Well, conversion disorder is a, 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 such a kind of a disorder that was, became uh, uh, famous by uh, Charcot, who was a professor in Paris at the time, and he had this patient who was uh, 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 fainting all the time. But it, in the category in our DSM uh, diagnostic manual, it says that it affects body movement with the sensor, sen sensory si system, and it can't be explained by any medical condition, and it causes distress or problems uh, or whatever. And when the neurologist has gone through the patient once and twice and three times, and they can't find anything, they tell us that this is a conversion disorder, and the, uh, the patient is sent back to us psychiatrists, and we get very nervous when, when we don't want to question the neurologist because they really know, and, uh, and we just like feel. Uh, uh, this patient, when I met her, uh, she came through the Pans Fund, uh, Foundation or Pans Organization in Sweden. She fulfilled uh, 14 diagnoses. Uh, she had 62 different symptoms, so one leg of card wouldn't make it. Uh, she had all these uh, diagnoses, all these symptoms, and she was in a very bad uh, situation. And, and I remember she said to me once, oh, nobody believes in me. And I said, well, I do. And then she said, but it's only you, Suzanne. And then I thought, and I don't really know if I believe in her either. You know, that's the thing. I think, this can't be true, all of this. Um, one thing I think it's good to do is to use a telephone for making a um, film from the patient. Because you, I would say most of the things I learned throughout the years are through my patients. And this is... Uh, it's in the, in the end, of pre, uh, end of an attack, rage, I think, and then comes the pain, and, um, and I don't know if you would call this a conversion disorder. And this is in her room with her mother.
She had this recurring tonsillitis, uh, and I sent her for taking the tonsils away. And this is uh, during the wake up, and, uh, and they sent off to her mother because her way, weird behavior. Uh, I think I have to do like this. And she has shared this, she's not even awake. And this is uh, what's going on. So they were not uh, due to this behavior of the patient. And, and I know there was, I mean, this is not conversion disorder. And the MS and Mark uh, did this uh, cognitive uh, test on her, and we had signs that she was actually deteriorating, and her IQ was rather low, uh, considering how she must have been once upon a time. So uh, we decided that we had research money left over, and let's make a fishing expedition. So we took everything, you know, we didn't look at what it would cost. And, and then the lab called back and said, well, the you can't really, this a hit here, it's a positive for aquaporin 4. And this, I don't even know what that was, but I, I understood it was in psychiatry, and I sent her immediately away to the neurology department, because I now, at least, now it's your patient. Come on, it's your patient. And, uh, but they just looked through the journals and said, oh, this is a conversion disorder, home go. So they, they didn't even really keep her there for 24 hours, the center room. And um, what happened? Well, she got pregnant and she improved considerably. And um, uh, because pregnancy affects your immune system, so this is why some people with autoimmune disorders are improved during pregnancy. But then she relapsed and she was almost losing her sight, which is one sign of myelitis optica, which she had. Uh, and got and happily enough, it's really good for the patient to get something real because now she was treated with rituximab, which made all the difference in the world and all her psychiatric and uh, our conversion disorder also disappeared. We published this earlier this year. Uh, so one could ask you oneself, why can't psychiatrists recognize the pulse group among other patients? And one part is perhaps that we think of psychiatric diagnosis as circumscribed, and they are obviously not. Um, also, uh, most physicians don't believe in uh, what you cannot see is not there. Perhaps psychiatrists think so, but other physicians don't. They want to, some, they want to really have evidence. And psychiatrists, we are quite uncomfortable to undress the patient and do a clinical examination and to make them uh, to, you know, to test uh, functions. Uh, uh, so there's a big gap between uh, psychiatrists and, 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 and the somatic medicine and neurologists. Um, um, and we also uh, don't want to question evidence uh, knowledge. We don't want to go to be opposed to everyone else. And we lack biological markers. And we also lack good instrument for assessment. And I got so frustrated with the lack of instruments, so I decided to make one myself. And I hope it can assist when we assess our patients. And we developed it over the years, but we came with a revised uh, uh, PNISI uh, scale now, just a few weeks ago. And it's, uh, it's when standard assessment fails, when the work of the patient doesn't fit in. So it's not the first thing that you're supposed to do. Um, it saves time. You wouldn't believe it because I know it's 20 pages. Uh, but the most of the work is done by the, by the parents um, or the patient themselves. So they fill out the self-report, which is the first section of it. And the second section is a clinical interview that is based on the self-report. So there's a lot of pages, but not uh, too much in it anyway. And then there's also uh, a motor skill assessment, including things that uh, they do in, in Stanford, I would say. And there's a, a small cognitive assessment, and then there is a clinical summary. And then uh, the signs that we go through that are based on the self-report are uh, things that are, you could see in a psychiatric patient, but also in a PANS patient, patient or uh, a encephalitis patient. 
And uh, finally, there's a sum score, which is based on the endorsed items and not the scaling problems and global severity. And in the previous version of PNISI, we looked at the endorsed item in relation to uh, the mini and number of diagnosis in mini and severity uh, of symptom and gap scale. And I, I must say that it's the same doctor who made all the assessments, so it's, uh, it's not uh, evidence, but it's anyway say that perhaps this is, could be helpful. So I would like to invite you to use the rating scale. It's, it's on the website we call Memoyen, Memes and Genes, <laughs> Memoyen, and it's, uh, it's both in Swedish and in English. So please use it. You have to just go and only the Swedish thing you want to need to know is score no business. That's the way it is. Um, I would like to say just a few words also what we are doing in Örebro, where um, you met on your Eklund earlier today, and uh, uh, we can collaborate with uh, him and Eva Sandor. And presently, we are doing a, a study with Rituximab on uh, 12 patients that are markedly ill, treatment resistant with schizophrenia spectrum disorder. They are all above 18 years and they are low functioning. They have been ill for at least two years. And 12 OCD patients. Uh, it's not the dream study I would like to do, but this was was one possible through the Swedish uh, Drug Administration, uh, uh, whatever it's called, the board and the ethical committee. So uh, we have the least that we could do this study. And the first two patients we ran uh, uh, last week. And so far they're doing fine. And what we give them is uh, 1,000 milligrams of rituximab uh, just once, and it's added on to the usual treatments, and we follow them for one year. Um, I hope that if two of these patients from any of the groups recover, <coughs> we plan to do a, a multi-centre study uh, on a larger group uh, because I think there are patients that, uh, uh, not only PANS patients but also other patients uh, uh, could have a lot of help from, from these kind of, of treatments. And, uh, People who don't know how awful life could be with severe schizophrenia or severe OCD, uh, I would wish a thousand times uh, rather to have uh, multiple sclerosis than to have schizophrenia. And, but this, they don't, those who make decisions can't understand. Well, uh, I couldn't do this work without my collaborators. Uh, the most important ones have been the PhD students, Eva will follow, and she's done the, all the work on pans and pandas, and uh, Ulrika Lillian, uh, Daniel Merchan, who's done the work on, on this uh, 40 patients previously that we looked at cytokines and inflammation, and she's also a research nurse. And Sophia Segra uh, is involved in the Rituximab studies. And there's a lot of other uh, important people in Örebro, um, and uh, it's a very good team there. They have opened up their arms there, so I'm very happy to be there. And um, thank you for listening. to 
actually cover a, a, a broad range that, of symptoms that usually are not covered in the same questionnaire. Okay. And are you, are you preparing to collaborate with them? Since you are inviting everybody, is, is, yeah. is it going to be an international or only a national? Comparison or something like that? Uh, well, we use, I know it's used already in Karadinska and in the interpreting and child neurologist and pediatrician is using it. But um, we will do a proper study. Uh, if some, I will try to get Karadinska to do the study on the process, but they have some other things to do there. So, uh, yeah, you're invited. Uh, Everybody's invited. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see the outcome. Can you say something, uh, because I'm not a physician, can you tell us something about, about rituximab? How does it work? And, uh, yeah. Well, uh, I, I'm probably not the right person. Uh, it's a, uh, it's a, one of these, uh, uh, what they call biological uh, medi uh, medi medicines that they use for uh, autoimmune disorders. And I think about 10,000 people today are treated with this in Sweden uh, because we treat everyone with, with um, uh, multiple sclerosis. Most of them are severe rheumatoid arthritis. Really. But it affects the B cells and um, exactly how uh, and why it has an effect in some um, even psychiatric symptoms we can't really say. Okay. Uh, because in your study that, that, is, that just started, I think, mm. you, you didn't include PANS or PANS patients. Uh, you know, um, I, I think we include PANS and PANS okay. because I think they are all there among those in yeah. PANS schizophrenia. And we certainly look at them. But I, I decided to choose treatment resistance because the PANS patients are very often treatment resistant. So they would be included. But also I wanted to have a range of different patients that are treatment resistant within the same diagnostic category to see if it's just somewhere here that we could kind of pick up and uh, treat the And when we talk about resistance, it isn't the person itself that don't want to use it. It's well, it is also. You know, I, 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 in fact, I wanted to include younger patients. But now we have a schizophrenic girl who's 20 and she hasn't uh, uh, she she can't she hasn't responded to anything, and she was going to go into the study in two weeks and get the first treatment. And she called me when I was sitting on the train, and she said, "Susan, I can't go into the study. My voice says that you're you're really going to put something horrible in, into my and and I, I'm honest with you though that voices says I can't go into the study, and it's really very very frustrating for me." Yes. can be a person's resistance uh, for not wanting to, to take part of the, of the study of the, of the medicine, the medication. Absolutely, mm -hmm. and uh, the schizophrenic patients, I think in the beginning you have an opening, for, they want to have treatment because it's so awful, but with, with the years they are very negative towards most treatments. It's really difficult to get them in, uh, because you have this battle with the inner world. Very sad. Uh, I know that you want to, well, because we haven't talked about IVIG mm -hmm. yet, but I know that you have somebody here in this room that you have been treating. treating yeah, with, yeah. Uh, uh, actually not me. Uh, oh, she, okay. she, she was uh, a control patient in our other study, so she, uh, she had an extremely, extremely, extremely severe self harming behavior probably one of the uh, most severe self-harming behavior in the north of Sweden. And uh, but she's a very bright young woman, and uh, she came actually to be, a, a, to be a, a control patient in the study. And she had uh, some elevated titers, and she uh, herself went to the neurologist and told him, I want IVIG, and the neurologist seemed to Oh, well, it was a bit lost that day, so he said, okay, more or less. And she got this recurrent treatment, and, and she's been fine for several years until she, uh, several months ago, they decided it's a placebo effect. 
So they took it away, and she again started self-harming herself severely. And then finally we had the discussion with doctors who also here, here with psychiatrists, that the neurology department can't pay this year after year. It's not cheap. It's very expensive. The psychiatric department must pay, and they're paying it. So, and so when I got here, I got an SMS from her. I'm here. This wouldn't be possible four weeks ago, but now I'm on treatment. I'm on IVIG again, and I'm fine, and I'm here. And she's sitting here. And I said, And you know, people don't remember what happened today in the youth, in the childhood. And the adult psychiatrists are very bad at including uh, the parents of the patients. So they don't know. You don't know. You have to have the background from the, from the, from the parents or siblings to know what has happened. So I think it's uh, really uh, unrecognized. And I, I think we have to looking at uh, psychiatric disorders in a completely different way, which I hope I have expressed here. Yeah, you did, you did. How can you spread, spread this? How will that... Uh, uh, I think SANE is doing a wonderful job. Okay, everything is all SANE. Mm. This organization must do everything. Okay, is there something that you want to uh, add to what you have said today? No, I'm, I'm just very, very thankful to say because it's been a very hard work and I would like everyone to give uh, Gunilla and the board of saying a great 